Please excuse the short advertisement before I proceed. I am offering an audio course in conservation biology. Details are at the link in the description immediately beneath this video. As usual, links to the other articles I mentioned in this video are included in the attendant blog post at GuyMcPherson.com. That blog post is released coincident with the release of this video. First off, I have great news. As regular watchers know, this doesn't happen very often. I'm the king of bad news. Here's the big scoop. The six-month ensemble forecast developed by the Naval Postgraduate School on April 6th of this year indicates with great certainty that we will avoid an ice-free Arctic Ocean this year. When it does occur, an ice-free Arctic Ocean will accelerate a rate of environmental change already too rapid for vertebrates and mammals to keep up. Our membership as animals in the categories of vertebrates and mammals bodes poorly for our near future. But we have been granted another year from this direst of existential threats. On to the typical bad news. Along with a former graduate advisee of mine, I had a paper published in the peer-reviewed journal Bulletin of Science, Technology, and Society on April 16, 2008. It was titled, Implications of Peak Oil for Industrialized Societies. The paper was written about 18 months before it was published, as is typical. I have explained the torturous process of publishing a peer-reviewed paper previously in this space with a video titled, Peer-Reviewed Journal Articles versus the Corporate Entertainment Industry. The attendant video aired in early October 2021. At the time of publication, my co-author was an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee. He was on his way to achieving tenure and a very successful career. Here's the abstract from the peer-reviewed paper titled Implications of Peak Oil for Industrialized Societies, which begins by citing the U.S. Energy Information Administration's assessment of conventional oil, sometimes called crude plus condensate. Quote, the world passed the halfway point of oil supply in 2005. World demand for oil likely will outstrip supply in 2008, leading to increasingly higher oil prices. Consequences are likely to include increasing gasoline prices, rapidly increasing inflation, and subsequently a series of increasingly severe recessions followed by a worldwide economic depression. Consequences may include, particularly in industrialized countries such as the United States, massive unemployment, economic collapse, and chaos. End quote. The second sentence of the abstract again reads, quote, World demand for oil likely will severely outstrip supply in 2008, leading to increasingly higher oil prices, end quote. We were correct in our assessment. Gasoline prices rose, as did inflation. The so-called Great Recession followed. It's unclear to me whether the Great Recession has ended or whether, instead, we find ourselves in, quote, a series of increasingly severe recessions, end quote. Either way, the economic situation is dire, as I have indicated with dozens of videos in this space. Remember, the fastest way to destroy all life on Earth is to dismantle industrial civilization, which invokes the aerosol masking effect. We lose aerosol masking. The final sentence of our peer-reviewed paper reads, quote, Do we possess sufficient courage, compassion, and creativity to stave off chaos in defense of a just, sustainable civilization? End quote. In other words, I have been posing this question in various forms to anybody who will listen for a very long time. Before publication of our peer-reviewed paper in 2008, the so-called Hirsch Report was published in February 2005. It was created by Robert L. Hirsch, entitled Peaking of World Oil Production, Impacts, Mitigation, and Risk Management. Hirsch created the report upon request from the United States Department of Energy. The Hirsch report concluded we would need 20 years' notice to prepare for world peak oil. We might be able to patch together something resembling civilization on only 10 years' notice if we throw everything we have at the issue in a mad scramble. The peak of oil extraction can only be determined in retrospect. In retrospect, it was determined that the world had peaked conventional oil, sometimes called crude plus condensate, in 2005 or 2006. These numbers come from the conservative U.S. Energy Information Agency, as cited in our peer-reviewed paper, and also from the equally conservative International Energy Agency, respectively. The New York Times agreed with the latter assessment 
in an article published November 14, 2010. Remember, the Hirsch Report was published in February 2005, the same year or the year before the world hit the peak of conventional oil, according to the U.S. Energy Information Agency. Scramble we did. Digging deeper and deeper, chasing increasingly expensive oil, we pursued hydrofracturing until it was called fracking, otherwise known as business as usual. Chasing increasingly expensive oil also brought us the aptly named Deepwater Horizon disaster for five full months in 2010. Remember, the Hirsch Report was published in February 2005. Not surprisingly, the mad scramble continues. We are trying to cobble together solutions that address the suicidal idea of infinite growth on a finite planet. Enter the notion of renewable energy, which is sometimes called green energy, although it is neither green nor renewable. Wind turbines and photovoltaic solar panels require rare earth minerals for their construction. They are called rare earth minerals for a reason. Trying to power the heat engine we call civilization with finite fossil fuels is insane. Trying to power the heat engine we call civilization with rare minerals is a few steps beyond crazy. A reminder, the Hirsch Report was published in February 2005, more than 17 years ago. We've been warned. Our response to dozens of warnings throughout history became the unspoken motto of civilized life, must go faster. We are fully committed to implementing any solution that allows us to continue car culture. An individual automobile for each of us was never a good idea, but it's all we've ever known in this country. In the United States of automobiles, there is more than one registered vehicle for every licensed driver. Conventional oil peaked in this country in 1970. It was clear the United States was no longer the world's swing supplier in 1972. Shortly thereafter, OPEC was formed to ensure that political power remained with the most important material ever discovered, oil. Oil is used to extract everything else we need and want. In an age when we all seem to want everything, oil has become the pathway to obtaining everything. However, as I have discussed previously on this channel, switching off our use of fossil fuels means we will lose aerosol masking. That'll heat up the planet in a hurry, and not in a let's have fun at the beach kind of way. On March 26th of this year, The Economist published an article titled, The Transition to Clean Energy Will Mint New Commodity Superpowers. The subtitle reads, We Look at Who Wins and Loses. I think we all know this story. This, after all, is the story of disaster capitalism. The world has always faced a finite set of materials to power industrial civilization. The U.S. President, also known as the Commander-in-Chief, has always been charged with securing the materials we need to ensure economic growth. That was the point of the Carter Doctrine. That's always been the point. We tuck, tuck ourselves into bed each night, secure in the belief that somebody in charge will retain our privileges for us. It's easier to remain completely oblivious than it is to face the fact that our privileges come at a cost. For example, we have not figured out how to build electric cars without using fossil fuels. We have not figured out how to build solar panels or wind turbines without using fossil fuels. Again, this is the story of America. We want more, always more, and we want to be told there is no cost. Of course, there are always costs. The typical response is to look the other way. Car culture is expensive in many ways. Think about only the infrastructure required to maintain passengers for this one-person, one-vehicle system. The highways and the filling stations are among the costs, even if the latter are called recharge stations. It's the one-car-per-person mentality that created an environmental disaster under the guise of personal freedom. We have created a system that ensures we have personal automobiles and large appliances in every house, something that never existed before World War II. This system requires us to drive our personal automobiles to work, to shop, and to play. It's not only that we have become dependent upon personal automobiles, it's also that we have become slaves to these automobiles. As with so many science fiction books from the middle of the last century, the machines have won. Or, to put it another way, our so-called freedom has come with a lot of costs. The Hirsch Report was published in February 2005, more than 17 years ago. A line from John Kenneth Galbraith, Canadian-American economist, diplomat, public official, and intellectual, comes to mind. Quote, People of privilege will always risk their complete destruction rather than surrender any material part of their advantage. End quote. 
That's from the first chapter of his 1977 book, The Age of Uncertainty. One, one consequence of the people mentioned by Galbraith is that the mere reflection framework I have been recommending and supporting has little chance for full implementation in the short time remaining with habitat for our species on Earth. Bear in mind that I opted out of the monetary system when I realized it was the monetary system driving us to extinction. In the process of living off-grid for a decade, learning how to grow and store abundant food, learning how to secure my water supply as well as a decent human community, I learned about the full impacts of the aerosol masking effect. Fortunately, very few people followed my lead in living beyond industrial civilization. Doubly fortunately, the projection of an ice-free Arctic Ocean in 2016 plus or minus three years published in the 2012 issue of the Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences turned out to be incorrect. Nonetheless, an ice-free Arctic Ocean lies in the near future, probably in September of 2023, as indicated by scientists who have studied the issue. Full in environmental effects, including loss of habitat for our species, and therefore for all life on Earth, will almost certainly follow in 2024. I'm not a fan, but ignoring or misrepresenting the evidence is not an approach I prefer. I am reaffirming again in this space that I will not be making any sort of comeback. Not because I don't want to, mind you. As a result, though, nearly 8 billion people will not know, until it's too late to matter, about the loss of habitat for our species and what that means for all life on Earth. My attempts to pursue legal action in response to the coordinated defamation campaign that has effectively removed me from public service by informing people about our existential crisis died in the Bahamas when renowned attorney Gerald Maples slipped on a dock. As a result of my inability to counter the ongoing defamation campaign, I have accepted that my impact is small and will remain that way. My responses, as I have mentioned repeatedly in this space, include invocation of two short phrases from ancient Greece, Amor Fati, love your fate, and Memento Mori, you too will die. Thanks for watching, liking, and subscribing to the channel. If you subscribe, please click the bell so you'll be notified about future videos. Feel free to share this video. Become a member of this channel for additional perks at as little as 99 cents per month. Mostly, though, thanks for watching.